fact is, is that you can do more with 90% of his money than 100% of your own. And the 90% of his money is just the obedience factor. And there's nowhere in the Bible, by the way, that blessings come before obedience. Obedience always comes before blessing. So if you're not walking in obedience, you shouldn't have any expectation to be able to afford to do anything. Let's jump in. Today we're talking with Stephen Libman. He's a follower of Jesus Christ. He's the co-founder of Integrity Holdings, along with his partner, Travis Cotter, uh, which is a co commercial real estate investment firm operating in self-storage and multifamily space. They have got over $150 million in assets under management. Thanks for joining. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I love talking about business and, and Jesus, so this is a great podcast. To start, maybe you could talk a little bit about how and when when you got saved. Yeah, so I've been saved for 15 years now, and uh, I was a uh, agnostic, universalist kind of uh, in college. I went to Boston University. So I'm actually from Jersey. Now I moved down to South Carolina, but I did go to BU for school. Um, and yeah, I, uh, I was kind of not... Um, I didn't know the truth about the Bible, right? I think a lot of us learn about the Bible uh, secondhand or thirdhand from other people's experiences with it. And um, <clears throat> so I started going to church after I met my wife, and we went on a, uh, a blind date. I was a mortgage broker at the time. She was doing title work, and she... And I just hit it off over the phone, and only blind date I've ever been on, just had uh, some kind of inclination that I wanted to meet this girl. <laughs> and uh, we went on a blind date and started dating, and I started going to church. Her parents were both pastors. Um, so she's a pastor's kid, youngest of seven, and they planted the Church of Grace and Peace at the same time that Grace was born, and that's the name of my wife. So growing up in the church and then, you know, so I went to, to sit uh, just next to her in church as uh, a good boyfriend would do. And her dad is a phenomenal teacher and really understood the word and explained it in a cerebral way, not, um, not just kind of the different gospels that you hear of prosperity gospel, but like the real meat and potatoes of what the Bible says. And I was driving to work one week, and I just the Lord just got a hold of me. I recognized that I've been running from Him my whole life, and uh, I had to pull over. I was crying so hard, and just accepted wow. Christ uh, right there in the car by myself, and that has changed everything. That's beautiful. So you you got saved because on a weekly basis you were. It sounds like you were sitting under good teaching that woke up your conscience to the truth. That's. That's awesome. I love stories like that. Yeah, I'm sure we've. If you're if you're a believer listening, I know that you've sat in church services that were directly at you, and it was like one after another after another. And it was only a couple of weeks before I started digging into the Word and like really finding some truth, and uh, recognizing that what I thought about the Bible wasn't what the Bible actually said. So once those things started to align, it was a pretty easy um, transition. Mm. That's great. That's great. So your organization is built on the idea that, that you see the kingdom purpose very tangibly between the two of you. And I wanted to speak to you about that. It's, it's based around what it sounds like, resourcing ministries and using the, the tool of money to fund those, those ministries. Maybe you could talk a little bit about what the intention there is and maybe the philosophy behind that. Yeah, so it wasn't always this way. We've been in business for 11 years and I was always a tither and I had offerings coming through my household too, but it wasn't from a business perspective. My my business partner wasn't saved when we got met when we met actually. Um, so through the business and through just our relationship and through his own seeking, um, he he accepted Christ. Man, I guess it's got to be about 4 years now. Um, mm. and then we had to rewrite our business plan. Right after we both got saved, it wasn't just about the business and the finances and you know creating a, a good business anymore. It was how do we impact and affect the kingdom in a real tangible way? And um, wow, you know the there was a great um, missionary 
uh, what was his name? And he basically said, uh, you know, I'll go down to the pit if you hold the ropes. And I was like, man, this, this really resonates. Like our money isn't going to be able to, our, we won't be able to go around the world and do the types of uh, things that we wish we could just because of time constraint, but our money can. Mm. And um, that's what I think the rope holder is, right? That's the, the people that can fund many ministries. And we, uh, so we sat down, we wrote our, our VTO, just, just a vision traction organizer. And, you know, you sit down you write your core values and what the core focus is. And instead of focusing on profit margin, we wanted to focus on how much money we could give to the kingdom, right? And back in the business metrics from that number. And um, I, I got to stop you right there. That is really cool. I want to I want to unpack that a little bit. So you were looking at not from a, a starting place, and yeah, okay, I'll give out of the I'll give out of the increase. No, it's like let's look at the target and set up the metrics around that. That is cool. Talk a little bit about about that. How did you arrive at that idea? And maybe you have specific numbers in mind that you used to to do that, if you remember them, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, I mean, we all tithe on a personal level. So we wanted to know, you know, over and above the tithe, what does the business get to give away and how long do we expect it to take? Right. So we knew that, um, we wanted to give at least 20% of our gross earnings away, um, post the tithe, right. So more like 30%, but, you know, so for our first target, it was kind of arbitrary, frankly. It was like, can we give $2 million away in the next five years? And if that was the case, what does the next five-year growth plan need to look like? What's the one-year picture, the five-year target, the two-year picture, and what does it look like uh, in terms of acquisitions? And We're a real estate investment firm, so we do multifamily self-storage. So how many acquisitions, what kind of fee structures, how much cash flow, and then how much do we have to give away? And kind of back into those metrics. So how we came up with it was pretty simple. It was just that was a core value, right? Giving um, and being Christ-centered was the first core value. So we wanted to, you know, start start with that. And I'm hoping to beat that number. I'm hoping that God beats that number through the business. Um, but it was kind of arbitrary to start. And then, you know, we I think a lot of us get caught up in the when I make it there, I can give this much. And we certainly did when we started in business. It was like, well, once we make X amount of money, then we can give mm. this away. And just kind of praying, like, how do I get to give more abundantly now before we make it, quote unquote, mm. there? And uh, this idea of the donor advised fund was born where we literally carve out a piece of cash flow on every deal that we do for a kingdom building nonprofit. And we can, we, we like that idea because we can grow in the grace of giving. Like you can just, you can start today, right? And whatever you're doing, if you have a donor advised fund, you can take 1% of your gross revenue or 2% or 10% or 30% of your revenues and put it through a donor advised fund, which doesn't cost much to start and create and run. And it actually makes it pretty easy to track all of your giving through that fund. But then um, you can do a deal by deal, like, you know, the first deal we're going to carve out two and a half percent for a nonprofit, the next deal, maybe 4%, right? And as your business grows and becomes more solvent, that number can, can tick up. Our goal in the next decade is to be able to give away 90% yes. of a deal to a kingdom building nonprofit. <laughs> That's so great. <laughs> I love the ambition. That's uh, let's, let's reverse the tide. Was there ever a time in that history, whether as a early, you know, early in, in your in your understanding of kingdom things, when 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 you're seeing the beauty of Christ, you know the Holy Spirit's got a hold of you. You you know that you're called to be holy. Fast forward to now, when you've got this this spirit of generosity about you, um, if you were to go back, is there anything or is there any time where you felt a little bit of anxiety about that? It's kind of an unfair question just because of how I'm built, because my gift in the spiritual world is faith. So, you know, I don't look at it from an anxious point of view where it's like, well, now we're partnering with these nonprofits. We have to make sure that we're giving them what we're telling them they're going to get. And what if we don't make those numbers? You know, I've partnered with the creator of the universe on every deal. How, how can we lose is kind of <laughs> yeah. how I see it. 
Okay. Yeah, that's an unfair question. You're right. Talk to the people who are worried about giving for one reason or another. Maybe it's, you know, it could be because they don't feel they can afford it or, or it could be any number of different reasons. What would you say to them based on your experience? Yeah, I mean, well, first, if you're not tithing, right, if you're a believer and you're not tithing, I think that's the first thing that you need to, uh, to, to think about, pray about, and really get involved in. You know, we're called to be tithers. And the fact is, is that you can do more with 90% of his money than 100% of your own. And the 90% of his money is just the obedience factor. And there's nowhere in the Bible, by the way, that blessings come before obedience. Mm. Obedience always comes before blessings. So if you're not walking in obedience, you shouldn't have any expectation to be able to afford to do anything, frankly. You know, we're called to give uh, more abundantly. I mean, there, there's scripture after scripture, right? Talking about the cheerful giver, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Like, you know, we're <clears throat> we're called to be good stewards of uh, of our capital, and or of his capital rather. And that's that's kind of the first thing, right? Is you have to switch your mindset from mm-hmm. a being mine to being his. Yeah. And that's a difficult thing. Um, depending on how you were raised and depending on the household that you got brought up in, uh, you know, it was always in my household more like tightly held, right. Instead of like open palm and God doesn't call us to do that. He calls us to be cheerful, joyous givers, you know? So if you're feeling anxiety about giving, you got to get into the word because I mean, there's, there's so much, uh, grace, an abundance that come alongside of being a joyful giver, you know? So it's a mindset issue. It's a spiritual issue. Um, you, you have to shake that and really dig into it. Why, you know, I always go seven layers of why with something like, I, I don't like the idea of giving. Why? Cause I'm afraid I don't, I can't afford it. Why? Right. And then you keep going. You ask yourself why seven times you get to the root of the issue. Most of it is fear. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of fear around money. And there's fear about having a, a lot of it. There's fear about having too little of it. But that fear is really just not trusting God, right? If you're not trusting the Lord with your finances, where else are you not trusting him? You know, so it, this is an easy, tangible one. I think the money issue is the easy one, right? Because it, it starts to permeate into other areas where you can, if you can trust the Lord with your finances and you know I love that verse where they say you know he takes care of the birds of the air how much more so for you like do you trust that that's what the word says and do you trust that that is what God meant when he when he said it um, but this is a tangible thing I like being able to test and measure things and if you start tithing and you start to see your finances change for the better right that's testable that's measurable I remember the first year I begrudgingly became a tither because my wife was like we're walking in disobedience and I was like well we can't afford to tithe and she said we can't afford not to and it was just such a different mindset and I kind of begrudgingly started to tithe. And that year we paid off, you know, and I can show you the financial statements. It was crazy. We made less than we needed to. And we paid off like 20 grand worth of debt that year. I mean, it was just supernatural um, <laughs> finances. That's one thing that I noticed consistently um, among the folks that I know that have this similar philosophy towards giving. Of course, this is something that the Lord is going to be providing for. It may be a skewed data set too, because I have a feeling you're talking to a lot of entrepreneurs. So I think <laughs> I think your data set might be skewed a little bit too to that, because we all have to have a gift of faith to even leave a secure job to start our own company. So I think that trust factor is kind of in, innate in a lot of uh, of the entrepreneurs. But as you start to grow into it, and God never leaves you, and He's always there for you, and you never. Um, you, you know, you never fall down to where you don't go, get back up again, then it just increases that gift of faith, right? God hasn't ever left me before. Even in, you know, in the craziest of circumstances, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, Lord, I have to just give this to you because I can't do it and I really need you to do it and you haven't ever failed me yet. So, you know, that gift of faith just continues to grow and grow as God continues to show up more and more when you seek them. 
So you just prompted me. Maybe I should be asking a question. I should be doing sort of a spiritual, like a spiritual disc test. The Holy Spirit, are you <laughs> right? <laughs> Talk about your your future with how you see the organization moving forward. It will grow in terms of how much I think we carve out for nonprofits. Um, but this is kind of the way that I see us making the biggest impact. I mean, we love the deals that we're doing. We love real estate in general. You know, we're doing a $42 million acquisition right now. You know, the amount of cash flow and upside that these deals will produce for kingdom building nonprofits will be in the multiple six figures per deal that we do. So, you know, I, I, there's, no, there's no shortage of need in the world, that's for sure. Um, you know, we always like to say invest with purpose. That's kind of our tagline where people partner with us because we give them great returns, but also because they know that a, por a portion of the cash flow that's coming through these deals is going to save girls from sex trafficking and dig wells in Western Africa, you know, all kinds of amazing, impactful, um, just good things that are happening around the world. So uh, I don't know. I mean, if the Lord changes the model, then he changes the model. But as of now, this is kind of what he's given us, and we're going to steward it as best we can. How is it that you get lead generation going, both in multifamily and self-storage? Do you work with a broker? Are you going direct? What's yeah, the, so we used to – so we've done the breadth of it. I mean, we – uh, to get into the space, we partnered with an experienced operator who had uh, a deal under contract, and we just partnered with him on that deal, and then similarly on the next three deals that we did. And then we said, okay, so we can start to operate these things ourselves. We can go and find and source deals, so how do we do it? We picked the market. We started building broker relationships, uh, flying out there, taking people to coffee, lit, you know, seeing deals, putting LOIs out. It was mostly broker relationships. Um, further off market deal flow and just letting people know that you could execute. And we did a couple of deals that way. And, um, it's, it's been great in terms of a learning curve, but it also built a business that we didn't necessarily want, you know, hmm. having to build a vertically integrated asset property and construction management team in house is, um, a lot of work for what it is. And, you know, so we, we kind of repivoted the business back in November again and said you know what are we really good at and what do we what kind of business do we want you know we're investors first so we want the passive income lifestyle as well how do we get that while still being active operators and you know it's just pretty clear that we should go back to where we started which was partnering with experienced operators raising capital for those deals and being a partner in that deal and then just managing the investors and then managing the manager and you can do that with a much smaller team. You can stay hyper-focused. And you can partner with some of the best people in the business to really hedge your downside risk. You know, if we do a SWOT assessment of like what's our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, I, I would say in any uh, real estate business, the threat of losing money or not hitting the projected return profiles is the operator, right? So in some instances, it was me. And... You know, we, we wouldn't uh, we we would get our hands dirty to make sure that we were jumping in to make sure we were hitting those projections. But what happens with that is it takes a lot of your time. Yeah. Um. So we are now partnered with institutional level sponsors that have more deals than we can fund. Um. So our deal flow is not a problem. We we've pivoted to just a partnership model where we we're fifty fifty partners with institutional operators that. You know, we have a $42 million project going right now. We have a $60 million project right behind that. You know, these guys have a billion dollars plus under management. So deals are, uh, are not the issue in terms of sourcing them anymore. Uh, they were, but also that's a full-time job, right? Acquisitions, marketing, finding those deals, submitting LOIs. That's, that's, that's a full-time position in and of itself. Oh, yeah. So you're going to have close to, after this, $250 million under management within a year. Yeah, by the end of next quarter. Mm -hmm. That's great. A little hockey stick. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. Stephen, I really enjoyed our conversation together, just discussing some of these things that you've talked about, having purpose in what you do with the intention that you're using your money as a tool, understanding that it's not our money, but it's the Lord's money, by resourcing those ministries that are expanding the kingdom's range and purpose in their local communities. Appreciated how you spoke 
to the anxiety thing, coming back to the why of, of sometimes fear and your early story about how you got saved. I uh, love hearing people's testimonies. Before we go, is there anything that you would like to mention? No, I think it's a really fantastic idea to have kind of these conversations with believers. I'd love to uh, network with the other people that are talking on your podcast too, because we're clearly like-minded, and I think that all rowing in the same direction for the kingdom can really change uh, the environments that we live in and continue to save souls and build kingdom purposes. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's a great, great idea that you had to put this together. Happy to share on it. Um, if anybody wants to check us out, they can go to integrityhg.com. You can click on the invest with purpose tab and see all of the nonprofits that we're partnered with so far. Um, and that continues to grow with every deal that we do. But, um, yeah, always happy to uh, talk to anybody about kind of these donor advised funds and how they can get started in giving um, more abundantly now, right? And we'll just leave you with Proverbs 11, 24, 25. One gives freely yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched and one who waters with will himself be watered. Talk about an encouragement. Thank you, brother. Thank you.